is excelling joy of heaven to earth come down fix in us thy humble dwelling all thy faithful mercies crown jesus thou art Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 In the past you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sins. At that time you followed the world's evil way. You obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers in space, the spirit who now controls the people who disobey God. Actually, all of us were like them and lived according to our natural desires doing whatever suited the wishes of our own bodies and minds. In our natural condition, we, like everyone else, were destined to suffer God's anger. But God's mercy is so abundant and his love for us is so great that while we were spiritually dead in our disobedience, he brought us to life with Christ. It is by God's grace that you have been saved. 
in our union with Christ Jesus. He raised us up with him to rule with him in the heavenly world. He did this to demonstrate for all time to come the extraordinary greatness of his grace in the love he showed us in Christ Jesus. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It's not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. Amen. And we give thanks to God for his word. Last time when we were together, we were reflecting on one of those big questions. Who am I? This question of our identity. I spoke a little bit about the book, Sophie's World. How it happens in the book is simply this. Sophie checks out the mailbox at her house and she finds in it a simple envelope. And in the envelope, there is one piece of paper and on that piece of paper, three words only. Who are you? As Sophie reflects on that, she begins to realise she has no idea. She finds it odd to think that she really doesn't know who she is. I wonder if it's all that odd. I wonder if in fact it's true of many of us that we're not altogether sure just who we are. How would you answer if you picked up that envelope today, if it had been posted through your letterbox and you opened it and on that one piece of paper were those three questions, who are you? How would you answer? Last time out, I defined my identity by saying, first and foremost, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. And flowing out of that, as I try to work out what it means to be a child of God, then I begin to think about my connectedness, my relationships to God himself, to other people, those around me, and to the very planet on which I live. That's at least the beginning of an answer to the question, who am I, from a Christian point of view? Following on from the question, who am I? Which, as we've said, is about our identity. Following on comes this question, why am I here? Which is a question of purpose. What's the point of my existence? Is there any reason, is there any point in me being here? We all need at some point to work out our purpose. Of course, as a Christian, there are so many parts to that answer. And I'm sure it's not one against the other, but a combination of many of those different aspects. We could think, for example, back to Jesus when he called those first disciples, when he said to them, follow me and I will teach you to fish for people. Maybe that's part of our purpose. Yes, to follow Jesus and to fish for people, which is about embracing other people in the net of God's love expressed in Jesus or at the end of the Gospels when we find Jesus again with his followers, now after, of course, his death and rising again, and saying to them, go into all the world 
make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them all that they must obey. So surely that for the Christian will be part of our purpose to go into all the world, to share good news of Jesus and to lead others into that life of following after him as his disciples. Or what about this as we consider further the question of our purpose? The very last verse that we heard read from the letter to the Ephesians this morning. God has made us what we are and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. Sometimes people get a bit cagey when you begin to talk in these terms. Folks are wont to say, but we're not saved by doing good works, good deeds. No, of course not. And we don't need to go down that road. Clearly, it says just a little earlier in the passage, it is by grace that we are saved through faith. The amazing grace of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. It is by grace that we are saved. So we're not saved by doing good works, good deeds, but it's abundantly clear in the passage that we are saved for a life of good deeds. The jaw-dropping part of this passage is when it says that God has already prepared in advance this life of good deeds for us, this life of good works and service. Folks, stop and think about that for a moment. Almighty God, creator and sustainer of all things, bothers about us, about each one of us, and has plan and purpose for our lives. I wonder if at times folks are looking for perhaps something more dramatic. Well, maybe that comes. But it isn't, isn't it a great starting point in terms of thinking about our purpose, why we're here? To think in terms of those good works that God has prepared for us to do? Seems to me that if we started there, we'd be on the right road. Maybe the way to begin is by simple acts of random kindness. I noticed in our town, just a street or so away from where we live, one household has put a cardboard box at their doorstep. It's been there pretty well throughout all of lockdown. And in that box, they put items one after another and there's a simple sign on it which says, please take anything that you need. Well, there's an act of random kindness. It warms my heart to see that kind of thing taking place. And two observations I make are these. Number one, do we have to stop those acts of kindness when we get back to something like normal and out of lockdown? I'd love to think that our communities would continue to be kind in those kind of ways. And the second observation is this. Of course, kindness is not restricted to Christian people or churches. Far from it. Many folks are showing kindness now. Many folks are engaging in these good works and good deeds. And I, for one, rejoice to see that. Acts of random kindness may be the starting point for us as we seek to put into action the purpose for which we've been created. But there's more to it for sure. We might at one moment be random and at the next very deliberate. And when it comes to that deliberate working out of our purpose, 
then I think we need look no further than what's offered to us by the prophet Micah, who encourages us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Now, when we begin to put these things together, then we have the beginning of a strategy, a deliberate way of living in terms of our purpose being enacted. What would this acting justly begin to look like in a world that is still so horribly divided? What would acting justly look like when some have so much and others next to nothing? What would acting justly look like in the face of, for example, this recent pandemic, when it's been so abundantly clear that those in poorer communities have suffered considerably more so than others? And in the light of the most recent debates, what would acting justly look like when some are still treated differently because of the colour of their skin, because of their ethnicity? It can't go on. Acting justly is what's called for from all of us as we seek to work out our purpose, why we're here. And what would it look like as we started all the more to love mercy? Might it be that we'd be engaged with forgiving much more than is perhaps the case? Might it be that loving mercy might require of you to forgive that person or those people who have offended you, who have hurt you beyond measure, would love mercy involve reaching out to them and walking humbly? Might that mean that we have to listen more than tell? Might it mean that we have to begin to defer rather than insist? And might it mean that we move well beyond it's all about me? So, I am a child of God and so are you. And this God has plan and purpose for my life. And as for me, so for you. Go then and live. Tell me what a friend we have in Jesus. All oh, our sins and grief. To bear and what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit! Oh, what needless pain.
Lord in prayer Do thy friends the spies forsake thee Take it to the Lord in Hello, my name is Susan Brown and I am the convener of the Faith Impact Forum. Faith Impact is really where the church hits the ground running. The job of the forum is to help individuals and congregations, presbyteries and the church as a whole to live out Jesus' call for all to have life and to have it in fullness. We're about caring for those who are on the margins in Scotland and in every corner of the world. And we're about caring too for that world itself. How do we pursue the peace and justice that Jesus called for, for people and for the world? How do we work with our Lord in transforming this world in the light of God's love? Well, we do it by listening to people's stories, by speaking out, by standing up, by reaching out, by holding, and of course, by praying. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, since the beginning of time, you have so generously given to us. The breath you breathed in creation brought every living thing into being. Help us, we pray, not to take that creation for granted. Help us to care for it, to protect it, to nurture it, as well as enjoy it. Help us, Heavenly Father, to live responsibly. You have given us people too to share this world with. When we fail to notice the needs of others, when we don't hear their cries or see their tears, open, we pray, our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts and open our hands to hear and see and hold and help. Father, you sent your Son for the sake of all humanity. Inspire us to live as sisters and brothers and to live that connectedness generously and lovingly, enjoying the companionship of your people in every part of the world as we journey through this life together. Heavenly Father, just like your Son, plant in us a discontent with injustice. Give us the courage to stand against what is unfair and help us to reach out to those who are suffering, suffering through poverty or prejudice or oppression 
or war. May we dare to speak out for change in systems and in societies that perpetuate such suffering. And may we model that change in the way that we live, as individuals and as a church. Give us the courage, Lord God, to love even as we are loved, and to do so in the name of Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. And so send us out, Lord, with your blessing, with your favour, which lasts from generation to generation. 
and extends to our children and to our children's children. Send us out, knowing that we are children of God and that our purpose is in serving you. Show us how you would have us live. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon each one of you today and forevermore. Amen. Face to